Good afternoon and welcome to our UB Alumni Webinar Wednesday series. My name is Christy Fields and I oversee the Alumni Career Services Program here at UB. Today I am honored to introduce you to Dr. James Lemoyne, Assistant Professor at the University at Buffalo, where he researches and teaches organizational behavior and leadership. James received his PhD from the Scheller College at Georgia Tech, where he began his spe specialization in leadership studies. He has authored one book, Business Defined, as well as articles in top management journals like Harvard Business Review, the Journal of Applied Psychology, and Leadership Quarterly. Before returning to academia, he has been both an entrepreneur and corporate executive working for companies such as AT&T and the Schwann Food Company. Dr. Lemoyne has won several awards for his research and teaching, including the Best Dissertation-Based Paper Award for the Organizational Behavior Division of the Academy of Management and the Frederick Jablin Award for Impactful Leadership Research from the International Leadership Association. He also serves on the Board of Directors for the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership, an international organization dedicated to fostering positive and effective organizational management. I am aware that some of you have already submitted some questions and we will leave some time at the end of today's webinar for Q&A with our presenter. If you do have any additional questions during the webinar, please submit them through the chat question box on the bottom of your screen. With that said, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. James Lemoyne. Okay, well thank you all for joining. Um, that, was, uh, that was a very nice and formal introduction. Thank you. I, uh, Appreciate all of you coming. I was a little bit humbled and flattered by uh, the number of people who signed up for this. Thank you for giving me uh, 45 minutes to an hour of your lunch break during uh, what is for many of us a very, very busy time of year. Uh, I'll try to make sure you get your time's worth out of it. I'll do my best. One thing I got to say uh, in advance, I've done a lot of speeches and presentations on servant leadership um, all over the country, but I've never done one quite like this. Uh, usually, you know, I do them to live groups, so I've never done a webinar before. Uh, I, I, so when I do it with a group, you know, I can have some audience interaction, we can have a debate, we can share definitions of leadership, <clears throat> you know, even start with a little activity. I can't do anything like this. You know, one thing I really love to do is do like awkward silences in my presentation to kind of watch the audience think, and I, I can't see you. Um, I have no clue. Uh, I have no clue what's going on in your heads or how you respond to anything I'm saying. So this is a a different context for me, so uh, forgive me if I'm a little rough around the edges. I'm trying to think of it. My first job uh, out, of, uh, out of high school, actually, I was a radio disc jockey. I was on the radio uh, in Louisiana, where I'm from. Uh, and I'm trying to think of this kind of like this. I'm broadcasting out. I, I can't see any feedback or hear any feedback. But if I get too much into it, if I start talking really fast, or if I say at one point, we'll be right back after these messages, um, please, uh, please just forgive that. And you see, I don't even know if you laughed at that. This is so awkward for me. So before I get started, uh, just a little bit about myself, and I, I didn't realize there would be such a, a great introduction, so I'll just run through this really quick. Uh, my name is Jim. Uh, I am a professor here at the School of Management. I'm in the Department of Organizations and Human Resources, uh, and that's what I focus on, really, is the leadership stuff. Maybe more uh, important for you guys, I'm not just someone who went straight through and, you know, just sits in my office. Uh, before this, I've got 12 years of experience as a manager, an entrepreneur, and consultant with a few different companies, some of which... Uh, Christy just mentioned. Um, so I've been there and I've tried the servant leadership stuff uh, out in the real world, and I, and I will talk to you a little bit about that. Um, she talked about what I've written and what I've done, so I won't uh, get into that. But again, thank you for joining me. I've been told I am to speak to you today about servant leadership. And that is a hot concept. Um, when I tell people that I'm a researcher who focuses on things like motivation and creativity and innovation and feedback and servant leadership, they stop me as soon as I say servant leadership. I want to hear more about that. I've been reading a lot about that. I want to know about that. It's a hot topic. Uh, the Washington Post calls it a path to high performance. Uh, Inc. Magazine says that it will lead you to success. Harvard Business School says it's so great. Why don't we have more of these servant leaders out there? And my favorite and most recent example, the New York Times published an op-ed by Howard Schultz at Starbucks uh, back in August, basically saying that we need a servant leader to be our next president of the United States. And he was complaining that uh, none of the candidates he saw really lived up to that high bar. We know we like servant leadership. We know it sounds interesting. Um, a lot of people want to do it. So what is it? That's really a good place to start, right? Uh, so I went through all of these articles that I just showed you and a bunch more to find where they said what servant leadership actually is, and I'm going to put it up on the screen right now. 
Now your screen's still black because none of them actually say what servant leadership is. All those articles I just showed you and many more, they talk about how wonderful it is, they talk about how great it is for performance, they talk about how everybody should be one, but I've noticed that they very rarely ever say anything about what does a servant leader actually do? Who is a servant leader? What does this thing even mean? So I took a step back and I said, okay, maybe if we can't define servant leadership, we can just get to leadership. So I'm going to click my button here and show you on the screen what the consensus definition of leadership is. And you can see we've got about the same thing. Actually, it's a fun exercise. Right before this, um, I went to the dictionary and I looked up leadership. Um, and it says, uh, for the definition there, definition number one in my dictionary, it said the act of leading. Okay, well, that's not too helpful. So let's look up lead. I mean, so definition one, what a leader does. Oh, okay, well, all right, now I'll look up leader. So I look up leader and it says someone who practices the art of leadership which sent me back to the beginning, and we're in a circle, and, boy, this is rough. What, what, how can we, how can we, I can't talk to you about servant leadership if I can't talk about servant leadership, uh, if I can't talk about leadership, and I can't talk about leadership if we can't even agree what it is. If I could ask you a question, which I really wish I could, but if I could, I would just call out, you know, how do you define leadership? When you think of leadership, what is it? When I do groups, I hear all kinds of things. Um, one time I had somebody in a cowboy hat stand up and said, leadership is getting people to do what I tell them to do. All right, well, that's, that's a definition. Other people say it's about motivating and inspiring. Other people say it's about being a good person. Other people say it's about accomplishing goals. Other people say it's all these things. What is it? These are opinions. Everyone has an opinion. So I thought it might be good to start this webinar by actually getting back to the roots and going back in time a little bit. And I want to tell you a little bit about what academia has said, what people who are paid good money to just think about leadership all day say it is, what people, uh, what, what professors define it as, what the academic press thinks of it, and some of this is going to make you laugh, and that's fine too. Um, the very first theory of leadership that I'm aware of was called the great man theory of leadership or charismatic authority. It was invented by a guy named Max Weber back at the turn of the 20th century, and it basically went like this. The leader is an extraordinary person set apart from normal men endowed with specifically exceptional powers or qualities. So basically Max's argument was leaders are born, not made. It's completely nature, not nurture, and only one in a thousand people uh, could ever really be a leader because you've got to have this natural charisma that draws people to you, that makes you very popular, that gives you a form of reference power over them where they want to be by your side and either you've got it or you don't. And I don't know, know about you, I find that definition kind of depressing, and I don't think uh, that leadership is, is just born, not made. I, I think you can have leadership trainings. I think you can get better at it. And uh, some of the contemporaries in the early and 20th century would also agree with that. This is a picture of General Dwight Eisenhower. I have lots of fun putting this one up on the board and asking my students who it is, uh, my undergrads, that is. Some of them do struggle with this. This is General Eisenhower, who basically uh, won World War II in the Atlantic Theater, President of the United States built the interstate system and was really known, something I love to bring up to my students, for his bipartisanship, for his ability to work across the aisle. He was also the very first general <clears throat> in United States history who ate meals with the enlisted men. He didn't go to the officer's tent. He didn't just uh, stay in his general's tent and eat the really good stuff. He always went and ate with the men who'd been drafted because he wanted to li listen to them and learn from them and try to motivate them if he could. First general to ever do that. Pretty effective president of the United States, and he was asked once what his definition of leadership was, and I liked it a lot. He said that leadership is the art of getting somebody to do what you want them to do because they want to do it. I'll say that again because I really like it. Leadership is the art of getting people to do what you want them to do because they want to do it. And this, uh, this actually motivated some scholars to dig a little bit deeper into leadership, especially at a school called the Ohio State University, where they developed a model in the 50s called the Ohio State Model because, well, they weren't too creative with their names. And they said that all of leadership boils down into two categories, consideration and initiating structure. They looked at factories and foremen uh, for, for months, years, just trying to figure out everything that the foreman did that could enhance job performance, and they were able to put them into, all into one of these two buckets. Consideration included things like treating people well, building relationships, looking out for others, being accessible and open, just basically building good, strong relationships with your employees. Uh, initiating structure included things more goal-oriented, like maintaining standards, setting and communicating goals, applying discipline, uh, laying out rules and procedures, basically making sure that things happened. 
<clears throat> this was a little more promising of a model of leadership. Okay, you be nice to people and you get things done, but it was really broad and there's so much here and what really is central to leadership. So, you know, there's not, a, there's not a whole lot practical that we can take away from this, except I will tell you that while you might think that consideration leads people to be happier at work and initiating structure would lead people to work more effectively, um, they actually both are related to job satisfaction and they both are related to job performance, so the best managers would use both. But, again, not very specific. Fast forward about 20 years and some scholars said, well, leadership isn't really about doing things, it's about a relationship. Okay, that makes sense. And out of this, this theory of leader-member exchange arose, which basically says that what makes a leader is the relationships that he or she has with his or her followers, and more positive relationships are better. And if you're you nodding your head or laughing a little that it took leadership scholars 40 years to come up with this, um, I totally understand. Uh, really, and, and I'm embarrassed to say this, the big takeaway from this theory that rocked the academic world was the idea that maybe leaders don't treat all followers the same or maybe they have different quality relationships with different employees. Maybe they have better relationships with their best employees uh, and worse relationships with their not so good employees, which I hope is obvious to everybody on the phone, but believe it or not, this was a breakthrough <laughs> in, in academia in the 1970s, keeping in mind that you know most professors haven't been managers before, so they haven't experienced this. The assumption was, well, of course they have the exact same relationship with all of their employees, but that's not the way it works. Okay, so we're making progress again, but still, <clears throat> we haven't really gotten specific. What is leadership? What do leaders do? In 1978, James McGregor Burns wrote a book called Leadership. Now, he's a political scientist, um, and this book is phenomenal. I would highly recommend it to anybody on this call if you can find a copy of James McGregor Burns' Leadership, in which he proposed a theory of what he called transformational leadership, um, in which leaders transform their employees into better people, into employees who care, and a few years later, in 1985, a business professor named Bernie Bass took it and developed a version of charismatic transformational leadership, as he called it, um, that was appropriate for business and organizations and institutions. It had four components. One was uh, being a charismatic role model of the ideal employee. Bass was very much influenced by the great man theory. Uh, challenging employees to come up with new ideas, new solutions to old problems, not just keep it on doing the same thing again and again. Um, developing employees, giving them the skills they need for their jobs, and then motivating them to care about the company. And now I think we're getting a little warm. This is sounding good. These are, I mean, we're still not too specific, but these are some things that sound to me like the kinds of things a leader does. However, <clears throat> this paradigm has also been the function of some criticism as well, and it comes around to issues of, <clears throat> excuse me, See, normally I'd pause and have conversations and stuff like that, so I'm, I'm, I'm not used to talking straight like this. Uh, this paradigm has been subjected to questions about morality and ethics. And I put it to you this way by posing a question. I looked at the attendee list, and I see that the vast majority of you are from for-profit companies. So here's a question to consider. What is the purpose of a business? Answer that for me in, in your head right now since I can't hear you. What is the purpose of a business? Why does a business exist? First and foremost, in one sentence or less, what's a business for? What does it do? There's been a lot of thought about this. There's been a lot of debate. Perhaps the most uh, famous viewpoint on the purpose of a business comes to us from the economist Milton Friedman, who wrote a famous essay in 1969 in the New York Times Magazine in which he argued against corporate social responsibility. What? Argued against it? Yeah, no, that's what he did because you know, in the, in the late 1960s, there was a lot of emphasis, as there is now, on responsible organizations and institutions, and that bothered him. That fundamentally bothered him as an economist. He wrote that there's one and only one social responsibility of business, and that's to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase profit. So long as it stays within the rules of the game, engages in open and free competition without deception or fraud, he was very bothered by the idea of organizations doing extra for customers, for employees, um, for their communities, for the environment, for diversity concerns, any of that stuff. And he had a really interesting ethical argument that I'd like to share with you. He said, you may say it's ethical for a business manager to devote resources to some corporate social responsibility. However, however, if you think about that, whose money is that? That money belongs to the owners of the business. We'll call them the shareholders, the stockholders. That is their money. And you are spending their money 
on a cause that's important to you. Was his argument? He argued it's unethical. He said he used the word it is stealing. For a business manager to take a company's money and use it for corporate social responsibility, he said if the owners want to do that with their money, with their profits, with their dividends, that's great. Good to, for them, more power to them. But it is unethical for a business manager to take their money without their consent and put it towards corporate social responsibility. And agree with it or not, you have to admit it's a pretty good argument. Uh, and it was tremendously influential. Um, and you still see Friedman all the time uh, quoted in The Economist and The Wall Street Journal, many other magazines, obviously a very, very influential economist, but not without his detractors. Um, a few years later in the 70s, there was a professor called Edward Freeman who had an amazing beard that I'm very jealous of. And I always thought kind of looked a little bit like George Lucas. And he said that Freeman, uh, Milton Friedman was way off. If you just look at financiers and finance, you'll miss what makes capitalism tick. You have to look at the value for all stakeholders. Originally, Ed Freeman said, stakeholders, they're valuable in and of themselves. I mean, it's one thing to make profits, but you also, a business should be taking care of its customers. A business should be taking care of its employees. A business should be taking care of its communities. He originally argued that's part of the purpose of a business, too. Later, he followed that up in the early 80s, and he said not only are those stakeholders valuable in and of themselves, but taking care of them would actually be the path to the highest profit. Milton Friedman replied to this and said, you're wrong. The, the, the economics don't bear this out. You, you're, you're really distracting us from what's important. Friedman said, nah, -uh. Friedman said, uh-huh. And it went back and forth for years until one of them passed away. Um, and people uh, ascribed to one of these two viewpoints. Who must a business benefit? This is a question I love to ask every group that I talk to and all of my students that I work with. There are two views. There's the shareholder view and there's the stakeholder view. The shareholder view says, it's the owner's money. It's the investor's money. That's who the business is there to represent and to serve, the shareholders. The stakeholder view says, yes, they are important. Don't get me wrong. I'm not just saying we're ignoring them. Uh, they are important, but they are just one of many stakeholders, which also include employees, customers, communities, diversity concerns, the environment, and so on and so forth. Uh, maybe the shareholders are the most important, but they're not the only thing that's important. And boy, I love having this debate. Normally, I would have this debate with you guys, but unfortunately, I cannot see nor hear you. So just to break it down a little bit more, this is the Milton Friedman view, which is the stockholder view, the shareholder view, that says all of business resources and performance are laser-focused going to shareholder profit. And you want to hear something funny? I'm, I'm pointing with my laser pointer at the screen right now to show you how it works, and I just realized you can't see it. According to the stakeholder view, it looks more like this. Well, yes, we are going to shareholder profit. Yes, that is a concern, but we're also concerned about taking care of employees, communities, customers, and just basically doing the right thing. So which is it? There are strong thoughts, you know, on both sides of this. <clears throat> and one thing that I will share with you in academia is only recently, uh, in the wake of uh, all the ethical scandals of the 21st century, starting with, uh, you know, at the beginning, you know, your Arthur Anderson, your MCI World comes, more recently to uh, scandals uh, like Wells Fargo, uh, we are talking about this as professors. And one thing that really struck me that I, I love to share, this, these are pictures of Nitin Noria and Rakesh Karana. They are very respected leadership professors at the Harvard Business School. And they wrote this book that you've never heard of called The Handbook of Leadership Theory and Practice. But I'll tell you, for people who are interested in leadership research and scholarship like me, it's like a Bible. And it was released in 2010. And they surprised a lot of people because they wrote in the first chapter, on the first page, in the very first paragraph, they were coming after business professors. They said, we are teaching the wrong things. They said, what kinds of leaders are business schools developing that have caused so much harm for so many? Are these institutions developing leaders who have the confidence and character necessary to lead the web of complex institutions that have become so vital to the collective health of modern societies? They said that basically this emphasis on goal-focused leadership, this emphasis on transformational charismatic leadership, without thinking about ethical concerns, without thinking about the ramifications of the, on the employees, um, was bad for society and we needed to step away from it. And there are debates about that going on right now uh, at academic conferences, and there are debates about that going on right now in boardrooms as well. Now, it was at this point, as I was putting the PowerPoint together for today's webinar, that I realized that this was supposed to be about servant leadership. And I've gone way down a tangent, and I haven't even mentioned the term servant leadership 
by my count, at least 10 minutes. So, you know, I probably had some people hang up on me. Some of you are wondering, where the hell is he going with this? And yes, I do really wish I had some ice cream. So let me refocus a bit, and let me try to get back to servant leadership for a second by telling you a little bit about a man with a stellar mustache. Honestly, some of the best facial hair I've ever seen. That's the second time today I've mentioned facial hair. Maybe I do that when I can't see my audience. This is a picture of Joshua Lewis Chamberlain. He was an uh, officer to the Union in the United States Civil War back in the 1860s. And he is widely credited as a tremendously important figure um, up there, frankly, with, uh, with, with Grant and Lee uh, and Sherman, as far as how important they were to the general outcome of the war, although he was never a general. I want to tell you a little bit about the situation he was in. Um, it was July 2nd. It was 1863. It was the, uh, the morning of the Battle of Gettysburg. So at this point, the Union, the North, has been doing really poorly, and the Confederates are pushing north. That's why we're going to have a battle in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, instead of, say, in southern territory. Chamberlain was the commander of the 20th Maine. He was from Maine. Uh, he had volunteered to serve when the, as the Civil War stretched on. Uh, he had started with uh, over 15, over 1,600, excuse me, over 1,600 men, um, and I'm not being gender biased. They were men, um, uh, but they were down to just under 300 uh, because of attrition, uh, because of casualties, but mostly because of abandonment and because of stress, because the war was not going well. Because they had gone... They'd fallen so far. They'd done so poorly. This was generally considered one of the weaker links uh, in the Union Army. He begged for reinforcements. He knew a big battle was coming, and he was managing a very important flank uh, uh, for the Union in this upcoming battle. And so they sent him some reinforcements. They sent him 120 mutinous men from the 2nd Maine. An interesting thing here, the 2nd Maine had originally been much bigger than this. And almost all of the men on the 2nd Maine had signed two-year contracts to serve. Well, the two years were up, and the 120 men uh, who were left were the ones who had signed three-year contracts. But they didn't remember signing three-year contracts, and they saw all of, their, uh, all of their friends, all of their fellow soldiers had just been discharged and got to go home to their families, and they wanted to do that too. Uh, the union was saying, no, we need you. We, we've got to have you. You signed this contract. But they wanted to go home. So they were openly speaking about mutiny, um, overthrowing their commanders, going home. These were the reinforcements that the Union sent to Joshua Chamberlain. Uh, and they told him, you know, you've got to use these. This is all we've got for you. You know, you've got the right to shoot them if they disobey you. What do you do? What do you say in this position? You're, you're on the eve of a battle that could decide the war, and indeed it did, uh, many uh, historical scholars say. You're in this situation. What do you say to them? You've got a chance to go out and give them a speech. What, what would you tell them? How would you try to convince them, persuade them, coerce them, whatever, to serve the Union cause. And normally at this point, I would, we, would, we would pause for about a minute, and I would have uh, the participants just think about this. And, and I encourage you, I hope you're thinking about this now. Imagine you are in uh, Captain Chamberlain's shoes. What do you do? What do you say? When I ask that, sometimes people say, well, actually, the most common answer, and I'll tell you, especially in my classes, is, um, we'll just tell them that second to last bullet there. You know, we need you to fight for us. I can shoot you if you don't. So if you fight for us, you've got a chance to live. That sounds pretty motivating to me. Pretty straightforward transactional leadership there, right? Some others say, no, I need to tell them how important this is, the war effort. Um, I need to tell them, you're a long way from Maine. You'll never make it home without our support. Okay, that's a unique way to go about it. How would you do it, honestly? It's hard to imagine these conditions, right, with so much riding on your shoulders. Well, we do have bits and pieces of the speech that uh, Chamberlain did give. I mean, obviously, there weren't recordings or anything like that back in the 1860s. Um, but thanks to diaries and journals, we've been able to piece together a lot of the speech. Um, and it wasn't a long speech. Apparently, it was fairly brief. And I've got, uh, I've got what we know of it uh, right here in front of me, and I'd like to read it to you now. He gathered the 120 mutinous men around him, and he said this. I've been told that if you don't come with me and serve in this Union Army, I can shoot you. He led with that. Well, you know I'm not going to do that, not to good Maine men. But I want you to know we're down below half strength. The Confederates are coming, and we need you, no doubt about that. Many of us came, many of us served, and many of us died here. 
because it was the right thing to do. We're an army going out to set other men free. What we're fighting for in the end is each other. We don't know the future and we can't plan for it much, but the cause for which we fight is higher. Our thought is wider. That thought is our power. I think if we lose this fight, the war will be over. We'll lose the whole damn war. If you choose to come with us, I'll be personally grateful. We do know for a fact that's how we ended the speech. If you choose to come with us, I'll be personally grateful. I can't speak for you, but never in a million years would I have come up with some of the words that he spoke that day. Any uh, Civil War buffs uh, like me or historians out there know what happened next. Um, all 120 of the men volunteered to stay on. All talk of mutiny was gone. They had to defend Little Round Top. They ran out of ammunition. He called the bayonet charge that effectively turned the tide of the Civil War. He successfully defended it with his 386 men, captured almost 400 Confederate prisoners. Think about that, captured, not even shot, captured almost as many people as he had. And historians do agree that this was the turning point of the war for the Union. So why am I telling you this story? What does this have to do with anything? Because I really think this is a phenomenal example of servant leadership in action. I always think about it when I try to think of what is servant leadership. First up, he didn't coerce. He could have. I know there are a lot of high-level managers on this call right now, and I know that you have the power to coerce. You have the power to punish. Because of your title, you can make people do what you want <clears throat> because you're the boss, and that's fine. And sometimes I do believe that's called for. Uh, but in this case, Chamberlain didn't coerce. He persuaded them. He persuaded the men that the cause they were involved in was something noble, that it was something worth doing, that it was something they would be proud to be a part of. He persuaded them that together they had a better future than if they had moved apart, if they came together to fight for this goal. He respected them. He said that right at the beginning. They told me I could shoot you. I'm not going to do that. Not to good main men, but I want to help you. I want to help you, and he told them, we need you to help others. He turned the tide of a war. Literally, this man changed the course of our nation through that speech. That was a pivotal, pivotal moment in our nation's history. And this, to me, everything I just said, that's servant leadership. I freely tell you, when I go to some organizations, they are kind of hostile to this concept of servant leadership, and it's possible that some of you on the call are hostile as well. I went to one organization right here in Buffalo, and I started talking about it, and one gentleman raised his hand, and I said, I'm here for a business lesson. I don't want to go to church. Okay, so that's, that's where you've heard about servant leadership before. That's fine. Um, I've, heard, I've had other people tell me, I, servant leadership sounds really nice, but it's just warm and fuzzy. You know, all this caring for each other and helping people and doing whatever your, your employees want and, and doing what they need, putting them before profit, that's, that's just that's too warm and fuzzy. That's not going to work in my organization. I've heard that an awful lot of times. And I think these are good points, and these are points worth listening to. Um, but I do think um, that they have a misunderstanding of what servant leadership is, and that's reasonable because we have so much trouble defining it, right? Servant leadership is not the care bear style of leadership, and if it is, that's a mean care bear. Uh, Robert Greenleaf, who came up with the concept of servant leadership, often wrote that sometimes the servant leader has to be hard, demanding, press for more, push people beyond their limits. Do not say, do it tomorrow, it'll be easier. Say, do it today. But all we really hear about is the warm and fuzzy stuff, and I personally believe that servant leadership is about a lot more than that. Um, and the pe people who write about it a lot uh, would, would agree with that as well. An exercise I like to, a thought exercise I like to do with groups is to challenge them. Think about this. Google. If you want to know something, you go to Google. And it, it, it ranks listings based on uh, how often people click on things. So if you Google great leaders, that term, great leader, what four names pop up again and again and again? Can you guess? Because there are, you know, you, you, get a few, you get a few Churchills. You get a few Hitlers. You get a few Mother Teresas. You get a few Washingtons. But there are, you get a, a more recent, you get a few Reagans. You get a, you get a couple of Obamas. Uh, but what four names pop up again and again and again if you search for great leaders? You got an idea? Martin Luther King Jr., Abraham Lincoln, Mahatma Gandhi, 
and Nelson Mandela. And all four of these have been written about as exemplars of this whole servant leadership thing. And, and when I look at these guys, what did they have in common? They had a mission. They had a cause that they believed very strongly in. And I think it could be boiled down to liberty, for uh, freedom, for all four of these individuals. And they were willing to fight in very different ways to attain it. These were not soft, warm, and fuzzy people. I mean, even Mahatma Gandhi, with his... Uh, peaceful resistance, I would hardly call him warm and fuzzy. I would call him driven and willing to do whatever it took to get to his goal. That's more what we're talking about when we're talking about servant leadership. If we want to talk about servant leadership, I would be remiss not to tell you about the guy who first came up with it, or at least wrote about it with that language, Robert Greenleaf. This is a picture of him. So Bob Greenleaf, back in the 19, early 1900s, he was pursuing a college degree in mathematics. He wanted to be an engineer. He had no interest in any of this leadership and management stuff until he went to a required sociology course. And his old professor made a statement along these lines. And I'm going to read this to you from his book. There's a new problem in our country. We're becoming a nation that is dominated by large institutions, churches, businesses, governments, labor unions, universities, and these big institutions are not serving us well. I hope that all of you will be concerned about this. Now, you can do as I do. Stand outside and criticize, bring pressure if you can, write and argue about it. All of this may do some good, but nothing of substance will happen unless there are people inside these institutions who are able to and want to lead them into better performance for both themselves and for the public good. Some of you ought to make careers inside these big institutions and become a force for good from the inside. I love that speech. This is a speech that was written 100 years ago. You know what? I give this, to, I give this speech to my students on the last day of class, and they think it was written today, because it's still appropriate. Bob Greenleaf was really moved by that speech, and he said, this is what I want to do with my life. I don't want to be, but I'm about to graduate. I can't change my major. So he graduated with a degree in mathematics, and he looked for the largest company in the world where he could have the most opportunity to work with and help people, and he found that in AT&T. The American Telephone and Telegraph Company had the most employees in the world, and the only opening they had back then was for a post hole digger, a menial common laborer. With his brand new degree in mathematics, he took it because it was that important to him to be a part of this company. A few months later, he was promoted out of there into management training. A few months later, he was promoted into another management role, and he worked his way up through the company, finally landing in the position of director of management training, their first one where he stayed for many years. And he had such a neat approach to his job as a management trainer. I know some of you are leadership and management trainers, so you'll, you'll really appreciate this. He would take his first group and he would train them on, okay, this is what a manager does. You do this and this and this and this is what effective leadership is. And then for the next six months, he'd just watch them. He'd watch what they did. He'd watch what they didn't do. He'd watch how their employees related to them. He'd watch how their employees worked hard or had effort or were engaged or weren't. And he would take notes and he'd look, okay, that worked, that worked, that didn't. They didn't do that. That didn't work. Now I've got another group and I've got to train them on management and leadership. So I'm going to take what I had before and I'm going to tweak it based on what I saw for the last six months. So now I'm going to tell you management and leadership is this, 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 and this. And then I'm going to watch this group for six months and the same thing. And he repeated this process, ladies and gentlemen, for decades. For decades, he kept tweaking and refining what is effective leadership until he finally arrived at this idea of the servant as the leader. This was the essay that he wrote. Uh, published in 1970, six years after his retirement from AT&T, in which he summed it all up, in which he said that the most effective form of leadership is one where the leader is oddly, dangerously, and paradoxically a servant, where it's not just the boss telling people what to do, but the most effective form of leadership, he wrote, paradoxically, is the leader who cares, who cares more about his employees than effectiveness. Whoa, weird. This is a strange concept. So we can go back to the green leaf. And all, a lot of his best essays are included in this book, Servant Leadership, A Journey into the Nature of Legitimate Power and Greatness. That's where I just read that speech from. And in it, he does define servant leadership. And this is how he does it. He says, do those served grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? What do you think about that definition? Servant leadership is this. This is the mark of the servant leader. You look at the mark they lead on the people who follow them. Do they grow as persons? What is the impact on them? I like it. It sounds good. 
But even as, uh, as, as was mentioned, I'm a board member of the Greenleaf Center, the organization he instituted. I've got to say i got a problem with it. When I look at this stuff, growing as persons, followers becoming healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, these are the outcomes of servant leadership. This is what we expect servant leadership to lead to, but I'm not sure this is what servant leadership is. This doesn't tell us what to do to get there, and that's what I want to know. What do we do to get to where our followers grow as people? So we've been giving this a lot of thought in academia, um, especially out of the University of Illinois, Chicago. They've got Bob Leiden and Sandy Wayne, two brilliant scholars and two wonderful people who've really been trying to dig into this. What is it? What does it actually do? And they've come up with seven dimensions, servant leadership, seven things that servant leaders do really well that I'd like to share with you. On the ends, helping others to grow and succeed and putting others first. Okay, a little vague, right? And it sounds a little warm and fluffy. I apologize, but this is essential. Do your employees believe you will go to bat for them? Do your employees believe you are putting them first? Are your career goals more important? Are their career goals more important to you? Do you look at it, well, i got to look out for myself, that's reasonable, or do you look at it as if they succeed, I succeed? Are you helping them to grow and succeed? Are you developing them? Are you delegating? Are you mentoring? Not just in their jobs, but are you training them to take your job? Because after all, you can't be promoted if you don't have someone in the back ready to do your job. They act with empathy. That does not mean giving in to everything. That does not mean being warm and fuzzy, and it doesn't mean not holding people accountable. It means being understanding. It means getting to know people. It means get, getting to understand their personal needs, their own personal concerns, their own desires. A lot of managers, our studies have found, for instance, assume that all of their employees are motivated by promotions and pay, when in fact there are many employees out there who don't want a promotion and for whom pay is actually one of the least powerful motivators. There are statistics around this. People who act with empathy ask lots of questions and they listen and they're humble so they learn what are my employees really after. Empowering teammates, delegating things to them. You can get a lot more done. You've got people at your skill level who are doing just as much work as you are. Demonstrating conceptual skills is one of the pillars. You know, all this warm and fuzzy stuff, well, nobody's going to listen to you or pay attention to you or respect you unless they believe you've got what it takes to get things done. And if you're a servant leader leading a failing department or a failing company, you're not going to be a servant leader for long because the organization is going to fall apart around you. So there's got to be a little bit of that stockholder, shareholder goal focus where the servant leader won't be around for long. And then the servant leader engages in external citizenship because they believe that by serving their communities, one, that's a good cause, it's good in and of itself, two, that's going to make their organization more effective and successful in the long run. They believe that. And at the center of it all is behaving ethically. And that's an easy one, and that's one that I love slash hate to talk about because you can really dig into this, and academics have, philosophers have. What the heck are ethics anyway, right? Like, but it's not just an academic question because I think it's important to understanding leadership and servant leadership. Uh, the classic Greek understanding of ethics uh, as far as virtue ethics goes is just that, you know, be all you can be. Be the, be the best person you can possibly be, and that's the most ethical thing to do. And that's not how the servant leader thinks. Now, how most business people think is that ethics is about laws and regulation and co compliance and norms, not rocking the boat too much, doing what's expected of you. That is what you hear a lot in modern business ethics training. And I would contend, again, this is not the ethics of the servant leader. The servant leader believes in a more utilitarian viewpoint that, well, ethics means we help each other. We do the best we can for the greatest number of people. What are the impact on the greatest number of people of everything we do? We help those who are down up, we consider the impact on the least powerful in society, and we try to make the world a little better place, and we try to succeed ourselves along the way to doing that. The servant leader absolutely buys into the stakeholder model, as I provided it to you a little bit earlier. And I'm happy to report that there was actually some research done in 2008 um, with fi uh, over 500 of the biggest companies in the world in 17 different countries that specifically looked at which is better, stockholder or stakeholder. And it found paradoxically, statistically significant evidence that the top management teams who prioritize everything you see on the screen right now, yes, shareholder profits, but more than that, employees, communities, customers doing the right thing, actually had the most successful organizations in terms of finances, in terms of stock value, in terms of market cap, in terms of return on assets, because it worked like this. It turns out that there's a statistically significant relationship between taking care of employees, customers, and communities and shareholder profit. So not only are these perhaps valid means in and of themselves, but caring less about money 
is actually the way for businesses to make the most money. And this isn't just a warm and fuzzy anecdote. There's statistics behind this. I'd be happy to share this study with any of you if you'd like to see it. These were the CEOs and top management teams that had the most successful organizations. It's not a coincidence that if you Google effective leadership and you look at the categories that pop up, the first real category, the first model is servant leadership. Research has found that servant leadership, those seven dimensions I just shared with you, leaders who do those things at top and lower levels enjoy higher job performance, greater promotion focus. Their employees go above and beyond more at work, doing more than they have to. Their employees have greater job satisfaction. Their employees don't quit on them. They want to stay even if offered more money. Their employees have greater organizational commitment, and at the firm level, the firm performs better all the way up to return on assets. There's a great study done in 2012 that actually showed a very significant relationship, positive, between CEOs and CTOs having servant leadership mindsets and their firm's return on assets. What else? Well, there's a lot of research out there that says that employees who are led by servant leaders experience a great deal of trust. My own research, which I'm always really happy to share, uh, I found that employees who have servant leaders are motivated to cooperate with one another for the good of the company because they see that's exactly what their servant leaders do. I also found, and I think this is really important in the modern context, that they're more resilient. They're hopeful and optimistic, but if something bad happens, they are very resilient to that. They can bounce back and they can adapt. They can change. They can be creative and move forward even when the in, in, industrial environment changes or company internal environment changes completely around them. And then finally, my own, uh, one of my most uh, uh, attractive findings was that servant leaders are role models such that if you've got a first line entry level servant leader manager, their employees who are not in management roles, who are not in leadership roles, will start acting like them. They will become servant leaders. They will start training and developing others their coworkers, they will start putting others first, and that, that trickles down to the customer service as well. Uh, I used to work at a trucking company. Um, I'm not saying that this is an easy solution or a one-size-fits-all solution or that it works right away. Trucking companies, you know, they're, they're very unique. Um, I was reading a lot about servant leadership, and I was trying to be more of a servant leader. Uh, when I first started managing this trucking company, I had about 20 employees, and I'll never forget three weeks in, my employees came to me and, and they staged what they called an intervention. They said, Jim, we like you. I, I, we can tell that you like us and you're trying to help us, but you're not acting like a boss. They told me this. They said, you're not acting like a leader. I asked them, what are you talking about? They said, well, you're, and you're not making decisions. You're just asking us what we think. And you're, you're not staying in the office and doing your leader role. You're, you're driving around with us on our, on our sales routes and, and doing things like that. You need to spend more time in the office being the boss. They told me this. They said they loved it, but they were worried about me because they thought I wasn't doing what a manager was supposed to do. I said, well, okay, if you think so, and, and I'm taking your, let's see what happens. I will tell you that at the end of the year, and I credit this to a great team, and I credit this to servant leadership, we were the number one sales growth district out of the over 500 in the entire company at the end of the year. And I really credit that to my team, and I credit that to servant leadership, and I noticed that when we all got promoted, I was promoted to be a district manager and they were promoted to run their own districts, or, or their own sales centers, they were using servant leadership too. It took a while, but it did work. And this kind of gets into something about gender that I want to bring up. This was another finding from my research. Um, there is what is called the think leader, think male gap, where because of stereotypes, because of TV we've seen, because the President of the United States has always been a guy. Um, we tend to think of men as being more leader-like. My hypothesis was servant leadership would reverse that because if you think about caring and developing people and caring about the community, these are things that we actually associate more with female stereotypes than with male stereotypes. And that's actually exactly what I found. So if I could translate this for you, one of my major findings was often when a woman engages in effective leadership, there is, unfortunately, a subconscious bias in most people's minds, men and women alike, where they think, oh, that's, that's more like a man thing. You know, Sheryl Sandberg wrote about this. You know, little girls are called bossy while little boys are called leaders. There's things like that, right? But when a woman engages in servant leadership, it kind of bridges that gap uh, because people think, yeah, that works. That's, that's, that's consistent with the, the stereotypes that we have about women. I'm not saying these stereotypes are a good thing. I'm not saying we shouldn't try to get rid of any stereotypes about gender, but I'm saying that servant leadership kind of overcomes them. And women actually have an advantage, whereas men usually have the advantage in perceived effectiveness when it comes to servant leadership. So what's the big takeaway? Because I'm going over time here, and I apologize. 
Our research so far has demonstrated that servant leadership is a particularly effective form above and beyond more traditional goal-focused stuff, the stuff we teach in MBAs or ethically neutral models. Strangely, or maybe not strangely, despite its lack of laser focus on goals and profitability, research, hard quantitative research indicates that it is regardless the most efficient way to achieve goals and increase profitability. And for all this, you know, I realize I still haven't told you what it is. I've given you those seven dimensions, but I haven't told you exactly what it is. So I'm struggling with this, but here's what I came up with. Servant leadership is humble, ethical, and relationship-based influence behaviors oriented towards continuous and meaningful improvement for all stakeholders. And that all stakeholders is, I think, the most important part. Because, yes, profit is a part of that. Yes, goals and mission, they absolutely have to be a part of that. But we all have to care about more than that. And if we do, that's going to lead to more profit down the line. Now, I've got a last set of slides here that basically dives a little bit into each of these seven dimensions that I shared with you earlier. And what are some practical ways to do that? But, Christy, I know we wanted to open it up for questions at this point. Should I go into those seven slides, or should we open it up for questions here? If you want to take a, just like briefly go through the seven slides, that's perfectly fine. And then we do have a few questions that came in, and we'll leave the last ten minutes or so for that. Got it. Okay. Well, uh, I'll do my best here. Um, hmm, someone's calling me right now. Well, I, I think they can wait. So be a good steward, conceptual knowledge. Uh, I said this, if you don't know the basics of your organization and what it needs to do, nobody will take you seriously. Serve in leadership, if you remember nothing else from this, it's not just warm and fuzzy. If something goes wrong, you need to be the first one to know. And part of that is you're in the thick of the things. You're listening to what your employees tell you. You're not tucked away in your office. You are holding people accountable. The definition of accountability is a shared expectation that we will all do what we say we will do. Servant leadership doesn't just mean being nice and letting people get away with things. It means holding them to the fire because if you've got someone who is holding back the company, he's holding back everyone in the company, and you need to hold them to the fire for that. Putting others first, that is easier said than done. I tell you, I work with an organization that prides itself on being a servant leadership organization, but they got the lowest scores on this because their employees said they talked the talk but didn't walk the walk. You want your employees to put the company first. You want them to put each other first. They're only going to do that if you set the example, obviously. And a lot of us are accidental hypocrites, and I certainly have been throughout my career. This means prioritizing their needs. It means being flexible, not all the time, but as reasonable and appropriate, schedule needs and personal problems. And even adjusting team goals as people come to you and say, you know, the environment's changed, the industry's changed, our, our resources have changed. You know, maybe we, need to, maybe we need to listen and rethink some of these things. Helping others grow and succeed. It's been said, and I think I, I think I agree, arguably the most important thing you can do as a leader is make sure your people have all the knowledge and skills they need to succeed, not just in the job they have now, but in the job they have tomorrow, and you know what, in life in general, because that's going to make them a better employee. It means mentoring, coaching, training, modeling, paying attention to them, taking an active interest in learning about your employees, which takes time, and it's hard to set aside time for this. It doesn't mean, though, you have to do all the mentoring and coaching. Remember, I said that people who are led by servant leaders become servant leaders themselves. So maybe you've got, there, there are people on your team who could mentor other people on your team who are stronger or weaker on things. When I go and do trainings on servant leadership and they ask me to come in and do a follow-up, I said I can, but, you know, maybe it would be more cost-effective, maybe it would be better for the organization if you got your own people to do it. If you started a, tra I could come in and do a train the trainer, but let's make some local subject matter experts on this. Empowering others. Um, the traditional charismatic set leader says, I'm the leader because I'm the best, so I should be the one doing this. And we all think this when we get into management roles. Whew, I was promoted because I'm the best. i got to take responsibility here. Perhaps if I let my employees do this, I could learn something from them. Um, I, I've, the, the famous servant leadership line from AT&T that really stuck with me, and I should have mentioned this earlier, was that the typical manager comes into a meeting and says, how are you doing to your, your goals? What are you doing for the company today? The servant leader comes in and says, how can I help you achieve the company goals today? How can I help you? And that's a powerful opening. I have a manager who did that once, best manager I ever had. She knocked my socks off. I loved her, and I worked hard for her. Even a simple, such a simple thing as telling an employee, I'd like you to take the lead on improving this, you know that impacts their motivation and their effort by about 15%? Just something as simple as that. I want to give you responsibility over this. You're going to take the lead on this. It has huge impact. Um, always stand by, of course, in case someone gets over their head, and don't blame them if they mess it up. If they're trying something new for the first time, and you blame them, and, and you treat it as punishment rather than as a learning opportunity. There's another, 
There's another story from AT&T that an employee in the 1970s lost $100,000 with a really stupid mistake. Really, and you know, $100,000 in the 1970s is like $20 billion today. Um, he went into his manager's office and said, you know, here's my notice. I understand you're going to fire me for the stupid mistake. His manager laughed at him and said, why would I fire you? I just invested $100,000 in your training. Powerful, right? And that employee actually ended up becoming, later on, their CEO. Uh, build strong relationships. Realize each employee is different, not just different skills, but different desires and motivations. What motivates them? Do you know? Demonstrate empathy. Empathy. Open up to your employees. Do your employees know personal things about each other? That's really important for teamwork. And you prioritize one-on-one -on -one time with everybody, not just with your favorites. When possible, spend an hour doing their job with them, learning exactly what they do, what they go through. They really appreciate that. I learned that at the trucking company. You'd be a good citizen. Ask yourself this. How does your organization make uh, Buffalo a better place? The community, the region? You can't answer that. Neither can your employees. And if they can't answer that, they're going to be less motivated. What will be the effect of this decision on the least powerful lead by example? Take a prominent role in advocating for community involvement. Finally, in being ethical, um, research is indicating 20 years ago, ethics were optional for organizational management. Now with social media, um, now with heightened concerns, now with the many, millennial generation in particular, they want to know that their employees are trustworthy, honest, and fair. Best employees will lead managers if they don't perceive that. I've got a student who graduated in finance got a six-figure job working for a huge financial firm. He called me two weeks ago and said, I can't take this anymore. I'm not doing anything that makes the world a better place. I think I'm hurting it. I'm quitting my six-figure job, and I'm going to work for the Peace Corps for a couple of years. And that's an example. This happens. This is what they're looking for. It doesn't just mean following the rules and standard procedures. It means caring about the impacts and decisions on all stakeholders. Coach employees keep stakeholders in mind. Just asking, is it good for the company? That's a question I heard a lot when I, was, uh, when I was in the corporate world. That's an important question, but I would argue that it is only part of the question. Um, and that, in a nutshell, in 50 minutes, sorry about going over, is servant leadership, so we'll open it up for questions. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Lemoyne. Uh, the first question that we have that did come through is, can you just maybe expand a little bit on why the name servant? Um, somebody said their first reaction was maybe a little bit more negative towards this word? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and, and I have fun discussing that with my class. So the idea for Bob Greenleaf, who came up with the terminology, was that he really wanted to turn people's perceptions of leader, leaders on their heads. And he wanted to get across that the leader is not the person at the head of the table. The leader is at the foot of the table. Now, he was, uh, he was a Quaker. Uh, he was a Christian. So he was very, very um, uh, influenced by the New Testament. Um, the writings of, uh, about uh, Jesus, but actually he pointed out, if you go back to uh, classic writings on Confucianism, uh, Taoism, Lao Tzu, the Sikh faith, Islam, um, all of these faiths have this idea of service as very central, and he really wanted to bring that in. Um, so he chose the word servant, and he actually wrote that for some people, um, perhaps especially minorities, um, this could be a controversial term, and, and he was a little concerned about that. Um, I will tell you that um, I find that when I do these presentations, I do find about, I'm going to say 15, 10 to 15% of the people I do it with who are minorities, um, African American in particular, say, yeah, I don't know how comfortable I am with the, with the context of that. Most say they are, but it's something to think about. The idea, though, is just that the leader serves the followers. He, put, he or she is putting them first. Um, there is conversation sometimes that, well, I wonder if there's a better term. It's forceful, it's upfront, and Bob Greenleaf wrote, it's supposed to make you a little bit uncomfortable. It's supposed to challenge preconceived notions. So it's an interesting question. Excellent. Another question, um, can you share any companies that you feel have really um, brought into and practiced servant leadership and even some um, individuals in today's society, um, some current um, individuals who are practicing servant leadership as well? Uh, sure. I, I would love to tell you about some of the companies I'm doing research with because I'm finding some that are just doing a phenomenal job. However, uh, I keep them confidential, so I can't share their names. But I'll tell you there's some companies right here in Buffalo that are doing a great job. Um, uh, Zappos is known for their servant leadership culture. Intel, Medtronic, Delta. One that I am a huge fan of and I would recommend if you're interested in this, Southwest Airlines. Herb Keller um, wrote the book Nuts uh, a while back. 
widely acknowledged as one of the most successful CEOs of the 20th century, um, personified servant leadership in so many ways. So many of the stories I've told are very applicable to what he did at Southwest Airlines. So that's a great book to look up. Um, I will tell you, I can tell you this, a friend of mine uh, is named Cheryl Backelder. Um, she is the CEO of Popeye's. Uh, Louisiana Kitchen, and she pretty much oversaw it going from one of the uh, fastest declining fast food chains to one of the fastest growing. And she did that. She credited it to incorporating a servant leadership mindset there. She wrote a book recently called Dare to Serve, um, which is uh, which I helped her with a little bit. So I guess I'm, I'm kind of being uh, self-promotional here, but I don't get any money from it. Um, and it's a really good book. Uh, that I would recommend. Let's see, what else? I, I talked about Zappos, Intel. Uh, those are those are some of the big ones that I would mention up front. Excellent. Uh, another question: What do you do if you are a mid-level manager who models servant leadership qualities with your own team, but you have a supervisor who doesn't, um, you know, model servant leadership? Yeah. So that's that's a rough question. That's that's a really tough one. And I I personally found myself in that situation, and uh, it was interesting. Um, so servant leadership, research shows that it's contagious downwards. Um, is it contagious upwards? I, I would imagine it is, but I would also imagine that's a lot more difficult to do, and I don't have a lot of research on that. Um, it's much easier to change a leadership culture downwards than upwards, and from the founder's perspective, certainly. But that's, that's a rough situation. Um, the research does tell us that if, uh, let's say, a second-level manager uh, manages five first-level managers, and if they see that the majority of their managers are using a different style than they do, then they will actually adjust and tweak their own style to match it. Um, so it's kind of the power of coalitions here, right? So uh, strength in numbers, so much and so forth. Um, there's also a lot of research that says that role modeling can happen up or down, such that if your boss sees that you are being tremendously successful and they ask you why and you say, well, because I do this, this, and this, servant leadership type stuff, they're going to be a lot more open to it. But that doesn't mean they will be open to it. Um, some people are kind of like the truck drivers, like, what, what the heck is this? This isn't, or like I said, this is, this is church stuff, this is warm and fuzzy, this isn't leadership. Uh, in the absence of research, to back it up, I don't want to lie to you, I'd say, the only thing you can do is lead by example um, and try to make sure it's known that you know, we tell your boss, I'm trying to lead in a different way. I'm doing this a little different than I've done it for the rest of my career, and I had this conversation once, and it was actually pretty good. I know this isn't the way most people lead here, uh, but I've been reading a lot about this, and there's a lot of good research about it, and I want to give it a try. Um, and let's, let's look together to see how effective it is. I had that conversation way back when at one of my old employers, and my boss, who was absolutely not a servant leader, still reacted really well to it, a little bit skeptical, but over time uh, I convinced him. Excellent. And really just possibly to expand a little bit on that, another question um, that came through says, it seems that different individuals respond to different leadership styles. Can it be that a leader needs a predominant style but hold in reserve individualized approaches? Well, I don't think anybody would, well, I don't think anybody in the modern world would disagree with that, right? Um, every leadership style is uh, people react to differently. I told the story of the truck drivers, and my research actually shows there are people, uh, let's be honest, there are people in our organizations who are there mostly for the money and for the prestige and for the status, and they don't care uh, very much about working with others or working to better the community and so on and so forth. Um, so the question is, do you manage them differently? Um, or, And I'm just taking this from a servant leadership perspective. It's a really big question. We could have a whole webinar on this, right? But from a servant leadership perspective, do you manage them differently or do you keep doing the servant leadership thing with them? The risk if you drop all the servant leadership stuff with them is that you're perceived as hypocritical um, and that you're perceived as unfair. So if you're empowering a lot, delegating a lot to one group of employees, if you're community service projects, if you are giving them extra development and training time and you don't do it for this person who maybe it's not a good fit for, that can open up a whole lot of, a whole can of worms. Um, I would actually recommend if the servant leadership style is a style that resonates with you, and maybe it doesn't, right, because it's got to be authentic. If the servant leadership is a, a style is a style that resonates with you, uh, it will take longer to work. But our research shows that eventually it will work. And I don't know if that's a helpful answer, but that's the best answer I've got. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Lemoyne. Um, we are getting close to our 1 p.m. Uh, deadline here for the webinar. So just on behalf of the UB Alumni Association and the UB School of Management, I just would like to take this time to thank Dr. James Lemoyne for sharing his knowledge and expertise. We have recorded this webinar and we will send you the link within the next 24 hours. And we also want to let you know that there is a Leadership Accelerator program for those of you on the call from the Buffalo Western New York area, uh, February 23rd, March 16th, March 30th, April 13th, May 18th, and June 8th. So we have a series coming up. We will share this information with you for those who are local to the area in case you would like to possibly join us for that session or for those uh, sessions. Also want to let you know to please save the date for Wednesday, January 25th as Mr. Ed Bracca, UV alumnus and a career counselor here at UV, will be our webinar presenter and Ed will present on using LinkedIn as a career success tool. We will share additional details and the registration link in future communication. With all of that said, just again want to thank Dr. James Lemoyne for giving us time today. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day and warm holiday wishes from UV. Thank you.